Oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, and he's got, um, my nephew's got, like, um, now he's a little bit, um, he's got a dry sense of humor now. He still says just funny things, off the wall things that just crack his Good morning.
Jesus, for your spirit that is always with us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. This is uh, Chloe Myers. The first of December, Chloe came up. Uh, seeking and uh, she received Jesus as Lord and Savior of her life. And she comes the very first Sunday in the new year wanting to start it out right. Amen. Amen. And uh, Chloe, you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life and in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. great way to start the new year, right? If you're a guest this morning, we want to welcome you. I want to let you know in front of you in the pew back, there's a yellow card. And if you would fill that out and then after the service, take it back to the guest information desk. We have a gift that we want to give to you. So if you're a guest, we'd love for you to do that for us this morning. The rest of us or all of us now can stand up and let's greet those around us. Ready.
aren't you so thankful that we have such a great God and that we serve a great God and how much we need him. We need our Lord and our Savior. We need him in our times of joy. We need him in our times of pain. We need him throughout our entire life and in every season, every season of our life. Let's sing. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my. Hold him with us.
Thank you. You may be seated. As our men come forward this morning, I'd like to draw your attention to the insert in your bulletin. It's got uh, Dave Ramsey on both sides. We are offering some classes starting soon. Uh, Financial Peace University, which starts um, later this month, and then Legacy Journey, which is the follow-up to that class, will start in February. And my wife and I have both taken these classes. We've done these together, both of them, and I recommend both of them highly. They are really, really great classes. They're not just for people who are struggling with finances or need help with finances. They're for everybody, and they're not just for for young people or or middle-aged or or the seasoned people, they're for everybody. And so no matter what stage of life you're in, I would recommend these classes. And if you've got questions, you can contact uh, Nancy Dumas about financial peace or Stan Hutchison about legacy journey, and they will help you get plugged in. So just uh, as we start a new year, if, if you're interested in just seeing a biblical perspective on finances and maybe some things you haven't, haven't learned before, I would encourage you to look into those classes. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. God, I thank you that that you speak into every area of our life, God, and that the Bible speaks to us in the area of finances, God. And as we take our offering this morning, God, I ask that you would just bless the money that we take up, bless those who give it, God, and just uh, use it to do a great work uh, for your kingdom this year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To the bottom of a bottle Some people try to listen To a needle in their arm Some people try to listen To the money in their pocket Some people try to find it In another's arms You and I are not Just try to fill it. 
Happy New Year. Well, this week went by like that, didn't it? Uh, we were laughing in our house last night. I doing some work and getting some things lined up. And, and I was thinking, all right, now tomorrow morning I've got to get up and I've got to do this and this and this. And Megan said, Dad, tomorrow is Sunday. I said, no, it's Saturday. She said, no, it's Sunday. And uh, somewhere during this past week, I think all of the rain washed away a day of my memory. I don't know. But uh, anyhow, uh, we start 2016, turn the page, another year of opportunity right here in front of us. Uh, if you have your Bible, find Psalms 23. And I want to talk to you today about facing the future in uncertain times. Facing the future in uncertain times. You know, uh, we look at the country that uh, we live in, we look at the whole world condition. And uh, I, can, I, I think that we can all agree that, that we're living in uncertain times. Uh, we're living in exciting times, but yet they're uncertain. We're living in a time where God has placed the church and God has given us an opportunity to have an impact not only... Uh, in our communities, but also in the whole wide world. And so we live in uncertain times. David wrote the 23rd Psalm during uncertain times. David had uh, retreated. Uh, he was in hiding. Uh, he wrote this Psalm. Uh, and while he was in hiding, Absalom had rebelled. There was civil war uh, taking place. There was a revolt. Absalom was trying to overthrow David uh, for the throne. Uh, truth be told, Absalom was probably trying to kill David. And so David is there and, and he sits there and he writes this 23rd Psalm looking at his life uncertain of what the future holds. And, uh, you know, we look at at this psalm and we've read it so much and we've heard it so much and we hear it at funerals and we've heard it taught, we've heard it preached. And, and a lot of times I, I think if we're not real careful that we just pass through things and we don't really sink our heart, our mind, our life into what the psalmist and what the Word of God says. And I like the way he begins. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh man, what a way, what a way to face uncertain times. To say that, you know what, in, in spite of all this going on in the world that we live in today, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I, I was uh, driving in this morning and a lot of times when I drive in, uh, I'll listen to the radio son. This morning I, I'm driving in and, and this, <clears throat> this song just kind of came into my mind. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner 
condemned, unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful. I mean, have you thought about the magnitude of your salvation? How marvelous and how wonderful the salvation that you have in Christ is. Have you, have you paused to just reminisce and, and think about the magnitude of all that God has done in your life, that one day we'll stand before him as a child of God and he will look at us as though we had never sinned. And I'm telling you, if that ever sinks into our heart and our mind, if we ever grasp that, it's a game changer. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. You know, uh, the times have changed in churches a lot because not a lot of people sing. You notice that? Not a lot of people sing. Look around this morning, and some of us sit there like a totem pole, you know. There's just no singing. And we had a mixture day. We, we sing how great thou art. I mean, I mean, you don't get any more traditional than that. Then we sing some of the, the newer stuff. And, and you look around, and people aren't singing. And people say, well, you know what? I don't sing because I can't sing. No, you don't sing because you don't have a song. Because when God does a work in your life, he puts a song in your heart. And whether you can sing or not, it doesn't matter. You got a song, and so you sing because you got a song in your heart. The Lord is my shepherd. And in spite of anything that comes, that, 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 that gives just a, a, a comfort to know. Uh, it, it, there's a soothing quality to it. That there's a pleasing aspect to that to say, you know what? I am facing what lies behind, uh, ahead, with him as my shepherd. And because of that, I have strength. Because of that, I have sustainability. I have vitality. I have the ability to stand up under what lies before. The Lord is my shepherd. I mean, is the Lord your shepherd? I mean, how much do you love God? You might want to write this down. You love God as much as you want to. You love God as much as you want to. I mean, I can't preach, teach, entertain you enough to love God more than you do right now. And whether you love God more in 2016 than you did in 2015, it really doesn't depend on a program in the church. It really doesn't depend on a pastor in a pulpit. It really doesn't depend on decisions that are made. Whether we love God more in 2016 than we did in 2015 depends on us. He's my shepherd. How much time do you spend with God? How much time do you spend in His Word? How much time do you spend in prayer? How much time do you spend seeking Him? How much time do you spend in worship to Him? Let me challenge you to do something. We've got these devotional books and I, I was thumbing through them this year, and, and I think it's interesting. This year, we wrote about the gift of Jesus. Jesus is the most awesome gift we ever receive. And so there are 52 of us, and... Uh, from across the country, and we wrote a week, and we were assigned a week to write on, and I wrote a week, and others wrote a week, and, and what, what would be the harm this year in, in taking this devotional and just starting tomorrow? Week one, day one. Johnny Hunt writes about the gift of hope. The gift of hope.
And I can tell you, it won't take you three minutes to even read the thing. I mean, it's one page. I can tell you how many words are. There are 325 words total per day with the Scripture. Now, he might get a little bit more because he's the editor, but I can tell you, when they send me the template, I get 325 words for it all. You say, well, how do you know when you get there? Well, you click in that little box and you start typing, and when you hit 325, it doesn't let you type anymore. won't take long at all. I mean, you just open it up every day and you say, all right, God, today, I, uh, give me a glimpse of Jesus today in, in all of this. And, and we read the scripture and we read the thought and at the bottom, there's a prayer. Why not start there this year saying, you know what? Every day I'm going to walk in the presence and with the assurance of knowing the Lord is my Shepherd. Can those around you tell that he's your shepherd? Do those that you work with know he's your shepherd? Do those that you interact with know that he's your shepherd? I mean, if we're going to face uncertain times, whether it's in our life, it's in the life of a ministry, or if it's in the history of the world, I want to face it knowing that he's my shepherd. He, so he, he goes on and he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <laughs> I shall not want. Let me tell you the greatest joy, the greatest joy in life. The greatest joy in life is not what you accomplish. It's not what you build. It's not what you make. It's not what you accumulate. The greatest joy in your life will be giving away to others that are in need. There's more joy in giving than in receiving. And, and God is a giver. Uh, we don't want. He's my shepherd. He's all I want. He's all I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He goes on and he and he says this, he, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. For what? His name's sake. Not my name's sake. Not my reputation's sake. For his name's sake. You see, everything that God does in our life, He does it so that He receives glory and honor and praise for it. And our lives ought, ought to be lived in accordance with that to where when others see our lives, when others hear us speak, when others inspect our actions, when others observe our attitude, that others are drawn to the point that it is outside us, beyond us, the Lord is in control of our life and He's the one that gets praise because we walk in the paths of righteousness' sake. He leads me. The providence of God. I was thinking about this this past week. The Bible says that God is the God of yesterday, today and forever. God was with me. God is with me. God will be with me. And you know what? When you, when you face uncertainty, that, that, that brings a sense of comfort and assurance that God has been with me. He's with me in the midst of it. And He's out there waiting on me in the future. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Sometimes the shepherd has to help the sheep be where they're supposed to be. Back when David was writing this, it wasn't uncommon. If you had a wayward sheep that would go off, the shepherd would break his leg so that he couldn't walk. He would make him lie down down. And there are times in our life when God just says, uh-uh. 
Uh, you, you're, not, you're going someplace you're not supposed to go. I'm going to bring you right back here. And this is where you're supposed to be. He makes us lie down. He leads us beside the still quiet waters. He restores our soul. I mean, wouldn't 2016 be a wonderful year if we just started off with a, with a whole season of restoration in our life? God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. You see, I'm going to tell you, the problem in, in most Baptist churches today is that we've got over being saved. We've become so comfortable and so at ease with our salvation that there's no passion. Wouldn't restoration be a good start? God, just restore to me. God, remind me of all that you've done. God, calls me to remember the transformation that's taken place in my life. God, restore the passion, the joy of my salvation. It's amazing sometimes how we justify our lack of devotion and commitment to God. And you notice it's always somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's fault that I'm not living for God. It's always somebody else's fault that I'm not serving God. It's always somebody else's fault. Why I don't attend church. It's always somebody else's fault. Whenever people begin to talk like that, you just remember, they need restoration. They need the joy of their salvation restored. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And I like this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There is protection when he's our shepherd. When I was younger, we, the house we lived in had three bedrooms on one end and one bedroom on the other end. Mom and Dad, the twins, and Lynn were on one end of the house. And because I was the oldest child, they thought that they were doing me a favor, and they gave me the bedroom on the other end of the house. Now back then, I'm not going to say I was afraid of the dark. Let's just say I was afraid of what was in the dark. <laughs> and so I would go to bed early. Now, we didn't have air conditioning in our house back then, and so I would go to bed early, and I would lift the, the windows up uh, in my room. I had an old radio that sat on my dresser, and I would turn it on and I would tune in the Braves. That's when they were terrible, kind of like this year. Terrible. I'd get the Braves game on. And then I had a fan that I would have and I would turn it wide open and I would have it blowing straight on me in the bed because it was hot. And I would lay there. I would go to bed before anybody else so that I could go to sleep before they turned all the lights out. nights that I woke up after everybody went to sleep. And I would imagine boogers and haints and everything else. And so I would ease out of the bed. I would tiptoe down the hallway, past my sister's bedroom, get to my brother's bedroom, 
And I would go in there and I would ease into the bed with one of the twins. I'd say, scoot over. I'd get in the bed. My body clock was programmed to where it would go off about 10 minutes before the alarm clock in mom and daddy's room. I would wake up, get out of the bed, back down the hallway, get into my bed, pull the covers up, and I'd act lay there and act just like I was sleeping sound as a baby when mama came in the room. There really wasn't anything in the dark to get me. I'd see shadows and I would imagine things, but there really wasn't anything there to get me. You know, when the Lord is our shepherd, death is a shadow. It's not reality. And just remember, wherever there's a shadow, there has to be light. And Jesus is the light of the world. And so as we, as we live in uncertain times, we, we look out here and, and we see all this crazy stuff shooting people at restaurants. People strapping bombs to themselves and blowing stuff up, shooting people in concerts. The world that we live in today, it seems like all the fruits, flakes, and nuts have come out. But when he's our shepherd, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. God's with us. In the darkest hour of your life, He's there. In the darkest hour of your life, He's aware. He knows every detail. He knows the fear in your heart. He knows the thought in your mind. He knows the circumstances that you're dealing with. He's there with you. Rod, your staff, they comfort me. And then you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. God provides. Sometimes we don't see how God provides, but He provides. don't remember if I told it in here or if I told it in my Bible study, but years and years ago, we were pastoring. We were, that was when I was a young preacher. It used to make me mad. People say, you're just a young preacher. It used to make me hopping mad when they say that. Now I wish somebody would say you're a young preacher. <laughs> Take it as a compliment. I was a young pastor. We were pastoring the First Baptist Church, county seat. Gina called me up one day. She said, I've made a terrible mistake. And she was upset and she was crying. I said, what, 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 what is it? What's wrong? And she said, I've made a terrible mistake. And she said, I wrote a check and we don't have enough money to cover the check in our account. And I said, how much are we to the bad. And she told me, it's like $137.85. And I said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. You don't worry about it. So I went home and we went to her mother's that only lived about 15 miles from us at the time to have dinner that night. And we came home and when we got home, we hadn't gotten the mail that day. And so I went out and got the mail, and there was a card in the mail from Verlay Shelton, who was a member of our church. By the way, Verlay, at 91, 
went to be with Jesus on Christmas Eve this year. But Verlay had written a card, and we opened the card up, and in the card was a check folded in two. Gina's reading it, and she, she pulled the check out, and she opened the check, and she looked at it, and she started to cry. And I said, what is it? And she really couldn't say anything. She handed it to me. And so I looked at the card, I read the note, and this is what it said. I received this this week, and the Lord told me that you could use it. Love, Verlay. Would you like to know how much the check was for? $137.88. And the check was written, here's the deal, the check was written by somebody with the last name, Shepherd. Now, God meets your needs. He doesn't promise to supply all of our wants because we want, we're wanting people. We want it and then we get it and then we want something else. And we want and want and want. But God promises to meet our needs. Look at what he does here. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God takes care of that too. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Let me ask you something. If you lost everything you had, and there are people in our country today, people in Texas, I don't know if you saw what that tornado did, but they've lost everything they had. Some of the people that live along the river lost everything they had. If you lost everything you had, would Jesus be enough? If your house was gone and the stock market crashed and your bank account was not worth anything and you didn't have your, a roof over your head, if you lost everything you had, would Jesus be enough? David is writing this and his son has rebelled, trying to kill him, trying to overthrow his kingdom. And, and in the midst of it all, he said, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And I'm sure as he wrote this that he was grieved in his heart. He was sick at his heart. He was saddened by the conditions of his life. But he said, in spite of all that's going on, my cup runs over. Job had a similar response when he lost everything that he had, his children, his possessions, everything. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I returned there. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Where God guides us, He provides for us. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Salvation has very little to do with how much good we do, but it has everything to do with the fact that we've got a good father. Truth is, I can't do enough good. In fact, I'm, I'm just amazed that God would even save somebody like me. That God would forgive somebody like me. That God would be willing to use somebody like me. And so that's why that song means so much. I stand in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful is your love for me. My cup runs over. 
and the goodness of God and the mercy of God, it follows me all the days of my life. Aren't you glad God's not like us? Oh, we start and stop. I got out of the shower this morning and just shook my head. I thought, yep, 25 pounds needs to come off you, big boy. <laughs> At least. I'm into my medium britches. I got skinny britches, medium britches, and then I got my big britches. <laughs> and I'm pushing the mediums right now, okay? How many times have we started a diet? We'll start, but then, you know, we're sitting over here at the traffic light and we smell that barbecue at Georgia Bob's and we said, well, I'll I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat today, but I'll get back on it tomorrow. How many times have we said, you know, I'm going to make a new commitment this year. Well, we're going we're to be more regular in our worship attendance, but then something comes up and something else comes up and, and we turn around and, and we look back on the, on the year in review and, and as we look back, I mean, we, we're about 65% attenders during the year. Well, I'm going to get into Word every day and I'm going to set my alarm clock a half an hour earlier and I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to read a devotion. I'm going to read Scripture. I'm going to pray. And, and we start and we stop. We start and we stop and we commit and then we uncommit and we decommit. Aren't you glad that God doesn't do that? Aren't you glad that God didn't say, you're saved today, you're forgiven today? Oh, I forget it. You're not saved tomorrow. I'm just grateful that God walks with us all the days of our life. God's not an Indian giver. He's not a promise breaker. He's not a liar. He is the truth. And He is the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life regardless of what happens, regardless of who wins the election, regardless of what the crowd says, regardless of what the world says, regardless of the circumstances in my life, remember, this is written by somebody who has a group of people that are trying to kill him. But here it is right here. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how much? Forever. See, we lose sight of that. If the, width, if the width of this room is forever, if this is eternity, if we can measure it, our life is that much. That much of all of this is our life. And think about it, in, in, in the scheme of eternity, three inches in time. We spend all of our time, all of our energy. We are accumulating, we're, we're doing, we're building. All of our emphasis is on this much. When God has said, this is a forever deal. And I can tell you, if you, you begin to think of it in that way, that much. I am this much in the scheme of eternity. I'm like the particle of dust floating around in the atmosphere as far as eternity. When we get eternity in view, it changes things, but more importantly, it changes us.
How about you? Can you say the Lord is my shepherd? My shepherd. I mean, is he really your shepherd? Or is he a shepherd you know about? Has there been transformation in your life? No transformation, no salvation. Say, well, I, I prayed when I was a child and gave my life to Christ. No transformation, no salvation. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so the Lord, when he's our shepherd, everything else falls into place. Father, we begin 2016 and we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship. And Father, we worship not out of obligation, not out of duty. We worship out of our love for you. And so we pray today, oh God, that as we begin this year, Father, that we, we purpose in our hearts to love you more this year than we've ever loved you. And we understand and know that doesn't depend on anybody but us. Nobody can make us love, uh, love you less. We're the ones that determine our devotion and our love for you. If everything came to an end today and you found yourself face to face with God, would you be able to stand there and confess, Lord, you're my shepherd. Would you be able to stand there with the assurance and the confidence that you're his child. These are uncertain times. There's never been a more exciting time than, be, than to be a part of what God is accomplishing in these days. So as we, we're going to stand and sing in just a moment, and Rob and Glenn are going to be here. If you don't know Jesus, you say, well, I'm just worried about what everybody's going to think, what everybody's going to say. Are you going to spend the rest of your life sitting there worried about what somebody else thinks or says? only to one day find yourself before God and Him look at you, depart from me. I never knew you. You're a worker of iniquity. I can tell you what they'll say if you give your life to Christ today. They will praise God. They'll celebrate along with all of heaven. Just remember, you can be as close to God as you want to. Or you can be as far away as you want to. Lord, today we thank you and we praise you and we worship you for who you are, for the way you move. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We stand and sing. You come.
Hey, let me, uh, let me just speak a moment about these uh, devotionals that we have. They're out there in the lobby. They're $15. Now, if you go to Baptist Bookstore or someplace else and try to buy these, they're going to charge you between $20 and $25 bucks for them, okay? Let me say this. I don't make a penny on these things. All of the money that we receive from this goes into our missions account, okay? It goes into our missions account. And uh, let me just challenge you, if not this, something. Get a systematic way of spending time with God every day. Give Him some time out of your day, every day. Just read, pray if you're a couple. This is a great thing to do. You could sit down and do this over breakfast in the morning. You could do it around the dinner table at night as a family. You can do it in the, in the living room right before everybody goes to bed. I mean, give God some time out of your day every day during this year and seek Him, okay? If you're a guest, thanks for coming. I'm going to be in the lot. Pastor, I, I wanted to, <laughs> didn't mean to scare you. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to say very quickly um, that we are really, really thankful for uh, the ministry of Kathy Pace. This is her last Sunday with us as a pianist. She will be the interim um, minister of music at a church that I am, my brain has gone away on. But anyway, she will not be at Mabel White, and so we will be um, sorely missing her. So please, uh, let's, let's give her a hand and all that she's done. We love you. Well, we're going to miss Kathy. Hopefully she makes her way yes. back here. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully they make their way back here. But um, pray for her and Ramey and uh, their family. I think the kids are staying, right? They're going to commute. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, well, if you're a guest, thanks for coming. I'll love to meet you out in the lobby. Have a great week.